Good morning. morning. Let me thank you, first of all, for our summer here. Um, I feel like you've received me very graciously. We love you very much and uh, love you so much that we'll be back and uh, find our pew next week to sit in for, maybe not for life, maybe we'll travel around a bit before we decide where we're going to plant ourselves. But it occurred to us, uh, we are members of this church and we hadn't been here for a while because of other moving and for other reasons, but uh, we're back. We'll be back, and I'm looking forward to Pastor Scott being back next week. Uh, we're so blessed to have him, I believe, as our pastor, a great preacher, uh, has so many new ideas to reach people, and I, I look forward to more and more growth in our church uh, that we will keep reaching out um, with him at the helm. And uh, so let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word, that we can preach your word with clarity today. We can hear what you have to say to us collectively as well as individually. And we thank you for our church. We thank you for this Sabbath day rest that people have chosen to put you first this morning by coming to church together. We thank you that we've come to praise and worship you, to tell you you are first place in our lives and ask that you continue to guide and direct this church in the way we should go. Amen. Well, I start with a funny story that tells me it's time for me to quit uh, and sit on the pew. Um, we live in an area with many people. Uh, we're in, if, you, if you read what I said on Facebook, you know what I'm going to talk about. But we watch the children go to school. We purposely did not sign up for senior living. We wanted to be where there were all ages. But maybe I'm going to change my mind after <laughs> you, I tell you this story. So two little boys have come home from school. I happen to be over on their side of, of the road or in, uh, sidewalk or whatever, and I'm just chit-chatting, saying, did you have a nice day at school? Because it was their first day at school. Yes, they did. Did you like your teacher? Yes, we did. And I'm just carrying on, and he looks at me and says, you are old. <laughs> Thank you for telling me that. <laughs> I mean, I was, it, it was like he was astounded, and then he couldn't be quiet. I think you're older than my grandfather. <laughs> so now I'm teasing he and his little brother, and I said, well, am I, are, is it okay if I live in here? And he said, yes. And then I was pretending like I was really old. I said, I don't know that I can make it across the street. I'm so old. And the little one grabbed my hand to help me across the street. <laughs> so if you need a, if I need a sign, I guess I got it. <laughs> Gosh, you, you don't really don't understand how young people look at us, I guess, whatever us. But anyway, it's good to be here. <laughs> and... Um, I said when I first started around the 4th of July, I would probably talk about Ruthless Against the Devil and praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. And so that's what we're going to do today. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about destiny. We sang the new song about destiny, that we're alive for such a time as this, just as Esther. That's where we get the line from that, for that song. She was born for that day. We're alive, there's an allotted time for each of us, in case you didn't know that, in Ecclesiastes, there's a time to be born, to live, and to die. And so we have a destiny that we're called by God to fulfill. It's not just an empty wish, but it's we were born for such a time as this. Well, I'll tell you my story real quickly before I get into the word. I was born under the banner Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. Now you maybe need to be over 70 to understand that phrase that was around World War II. And I was born under that banner 
uh, praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. And not only that, I was born in 1941, December 15th, a few days after Pearl Harbor was bombed. I was born in Cologne, Panama, only because my dad was there working at the time. My older brother always teased me and said they mixed me up with a baby from Panama, and I was really <laughs> Panamanian. And so I often, you know, be careful what you say to one another. I think I believed that for, for quite a while. Uh, but I was born during an air raid and a blackout. So. I think I carried that banner with me and it has carried it throughout my life, praise the Lord, and passed the ammunition. On Sunday morning, December 1941, a chaplain had his most difficult assignment to say a prayer for soldiers uh, brought a U.S. Navy ship actively under low flying attack by the enemy firing from all directions. He quickly realized the best he could do because they asked him to pray. And he quickly realized the best he could do was walk the ammunition line saying, praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. Stories of the overheard phrase quickly turned into legend and passed between soldiers eventually reaching the press. And a, a man in 1942 actually wrote the song about praise the Lord and pass it. How many have ever heard that? Come on, some of you have, haven't you? Praise the Lord until they all stay free. So they all stray free. Very patriotic, very encouraging song for people at the time. But praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. I believe as you put those together, our ammunition is praising the Lord. And I want to start by reading 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter. If you're familiar with the story of Jehoshaphat, in this story, there are four enemy camps coming against the people of God. And they get the word from somebody that they're maybe, I'm not sure how many miles out, but they're about to come in to raid you and possibly kill you. It starts in 20 verse 1. It happened that this, after this, that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat saying, a great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before a new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? Do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people of Israel? Gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever. And they dwell in it, have built you a sanctuary, and in it for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, or will stand before this temple in your presence for your name, is far above others. And then he goes on to say, he, and now, here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would, let, would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt. But they turned from them and did not destroy them. Here we are, rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given to inherit it. O oh, our God, will not you judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do. But our eyes are upon you. Now all Judah and their loved ones, their wives and their children stood before the Lord 
and the Spirit of the Lord came through a man named Jezreel, a prophet, the son of Zechariah. And this is what he said. Listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, ours, it's yours. Our battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up, and they're even getting the instructions of where they'll be, where the enemy will be. This is how they're going to come up, and you go down against them. And you'll find them at the brook before the wilderness of Jeriel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And when the Levites of the children of the children of Korah stood up to praise God of Israel with voices loud and high, they rose early in the morning, went out into the wilderness, and they went out. Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me. O Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe your prophets and you shall prosper. And when he consulted with the people, he appointed those who would sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of his holiness. As they went out before the army, they were singing, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. God set ambushes against the enemy. They fought against each other. They all died. And the children of Israel went and collected all the spoils. That's one of the best stories in the Bible to show us that worshiping God causes great things to happen when we keep our eyes fixed on him. If you're familiar with the story in the New Testament of Paul and Silas were thrown in prison. They were thrown in prison because they delivered a young lady from demons and men were, were getting money because of her ability to walk in witchcraft. And so they set her free, but they were so mad because she was their livelihood. So they were thrown into prison. Prison would not be like it is today. There would be rats crawling around. It would be horrible to be there. But it says at midnight. That's Acts 16. At midnight, the darkest hour, midnight, they began to worship God. Now this was habitual for them. They were used to worshiping God. They didn't just start worshiping God so they could get their way. I have a good idea. If we worship God, maybe he'll show up and deliver us out of here. No, they, that's just what they did. And I want to encourage us, be a worshiper. Not just when we come here and are led in worship, even though that's very, very important. To come to the house of the Lord, to put him first, and come to worship him in spirit and in truth. But as they began to worship, these are true stories. These are not fables. These are true stories. When they began to worship God, all of a sudden, you remember the story, the cell doors were open and everyone was set free. And the jailer was so afraid that they were being let free that he was thinking about killing himself. They led him to the Lord instead. The Bible says they led him to Jesus. See, people get mad sometimes when you talk too much about Jesus. And, and so they worship God. Then the Bible says, Paul declares, for the, we walk in the flesh, we do not war in the flesh. 
For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God. Did you hear that as I read this story? They kept, Jehoshaphat kept turning to God. He even declared a fast for everybody to get into unity and in one accord. That brought that group of people into unity. You know, when we get into unity and in one accord, and I feel it here this morning, the unity, that we're here for one purpose, to worship God. And so when that happens, many good things happen because God has them happen in our lives. And so the weapons of our welfare, are not, they're mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. Zechariah spoke to the people and said, it's not by your might, it's not by your power, but my spirit, says the Lord. I'm a strong-willed person. I'm strong in my own right, always have been. We're Irish people. We just dig in our heels and we go to war. There were seven of us. We fought each other. We're not to fight each other. We're to yield ourselves to God and know that he's the warrior. He's the one that fights the battles for us. I, I'm sure you're like I am. Many times you've rolled up your sleeves and sometimes we have to roll up our sleeves and go to war ourselves. But we still know the battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. David as a young man knew the battle against Goliath was not in his slingshot. It was not in his ability. It was not in Saul's ability to put Saul's armor on him. All of that was carnal. When he looked at that giant, he was really, really big. And this is a really small. The odds are against him. Don't look at the odds all the time against you. Look at how mighty your God is. And he looked at him and he said, you come to me with a sword, a javelin, a spear. Let me tell you how I'm coming today. I'm coming in the name of Jesus. I'm coming in the power of God against you. And he killed him because he was in covenant. David knew his covenant with God. Once we come to the Lord and we're born again and we give him our lives, there's a great exchange that happens. No longer do I see myself as a sinner, but I know I've been saved through his grace, but not by my works. It's never about our works. It's always about giving our lives to him and then go in his strength, in his ability. God has called me many times through my life in a ministry of deliverance. I almost hate to talk about it for fear it'll scare somebody. I told you a couple or three weeks ago that God called me supernaturally to go to Mardi Gras. Dur I'm, go to New Orleans during Mardi Gras. I'd never been in my life, never intended to go there. That was not what I would call a good vacation. But supernaturally called me to go to Mardi Gras. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. But I was with a big army of believers that, that stayed at different churches with many leaders. And one of them came here a few years ago, Scott Hinkle, if you remember him. He is an evangelist. I love evangelists. And so he came, or I, w I was under that ministry. And when you went to the streets, you were going to, how many remember tracts? You were handing out tracts telling people the plan of salvation and hoping you ran into somebody who would really want to hear about Jesus. But most of them didn't. They were not there to hear about Jesus. And they let you know it in very explicit terms what we could do with Jesus. So that was shocking in itself. I was raised in church. I was not around people that talk like that. But see, I wasn't going in my own might. I was going in the strength of God, and I certainly found that out pretty quickly. That, and so the story I want to tell today is because I want to talk about how important it is for us to carry the light of Jesus Christ to this world. Stop talking about the darkness all the time. He's got the whole world in his hands. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And so we went for one purpose. 
If you remember, if you were here, I told you on the little tape I'd listened to that morning, it said, I died to make men holy. Won't you try to set men free? So that's what I did. I went to try to set men free. And so there was a man that was either a small man, either drunk, stoned, I don't know uh, what was wrong with him. But one of the evangelists led him to the Lord. And all of a sudden, I saw this little tiny man. I saw it step right out of the Bible. He becomes strong enough to move two huge men. And it's kind of freaking me out. Like, whoa, when he leads him to the Lord, he's having to just say one word after another till the guy prayed. And then the, the evangelist says, now renounce the devil. When he said renounce the devil, the little dude went crazy. Because you see, there are strongholds in some people's lives. And we are called by God to help them be free. And so I said to God, why are they not doing something about him doing this with this kind of strength? The Lord spoke to me and said, you go over there and do it. I said, excuse me? What? But he knew I had some experience in praying deliverance over people. And you know, don't pay attention to TV scary shows that show you about deliverance. It's not true. Jesus said, come out, and they came out. All we have to do when somebody is bound is say, in the name of Jesus, come out. We don't have to put on a big show. We don't have to have them screaming bloody murder. I walked over to that man, and in his ear, I said, shut up, because he must have been screaming or doing something. Shut up and come out of him in the name of Jesus. That man stopped as God is my witness, raised both hands and said, I'm free. I'm free. Praise God, I'm free. Do you people not understand I'm free? Oh boy, now that really got my attention. It's like, whoa, there are really demons down here, aren't there? Well, don't go there during Mardi Gras unless you <laughs> want to come out. Uh, don't go as an observer. Just go to win souls. I don't go anymore. I'm too old. <laughs> the little boy told me I'm too old to go to Mardi Gras. <laughs> but we're in a battle. Paul encouraged young Timothy to be a good soldier. Paul declared he had fought the good fight. We talked about that last week. At the end of his life, and he knows he's going to die a martyr's death. But he also knows he has preached to the Gentiles. He has done what God had called him to do. That's what I want at the end of my life. Did I do everything you called me to do? God's looking for obedience from us, not sacrifices. He told Paul that. I mean Saul. Saul was disobedient at the end of his life. He had consulted uh, a medium, like it would be a fortune teller, and that's forbidden by God, and he disobeyed God by not taking all of the enemy captive. And so he said, young Samuel said to him, the prophet Samuel, when he was saying, well, yeah, but I, brought, I saved the best. You know, he had his own good idea of what you were supposed to do. And God said, it is better to be obedient than bring sacrifices. So I believe each of us are called by God. May not be, it probably isn't as radical as needing to go to Mardi Gras and doing things like that. But we have neighbors, we have a community. I believe with all of my heart, he has called all of us to be able at the end of our lives to say, I fought the good fight. Now if you're fighting and you call it a good fight, that means you won. We won because he won. He destroyed the works of the enemy at Calvary. For this purpose was the Son of God manifest to destroy the works. We don't have to keep talking about darkness and evil works. We must concentrate. The battle, praise the Lord and pass the ammunition, means that we worship him and we stop magnifying our problems. We all have problems. We all can have the negative. We can look at that or we can keep worshiping God. In my Bible, for years, in the book of Psalms, I recommend you start reading the book of Psalms. I have circled just praises to God. 
through every Bible I've ever had. To things like, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. I bless your holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, who forgives my iniquities, who heals my diseases, who redeems my life from destruction, who crowns my life with loving kindness and goodness, and that he renews my youth like the eagles. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. I will say of the Lord, you're my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, in you I will trust. Clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. That's how we defeat the enemy. That's how we can say, praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. Amen and amen.